Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's tuning in, hoping you're doing well and staying safe. On behalf of Pipe Patro, Arab Oil and Gas Academy, SPE Egypt section, I'd like to welcome you all for today's long-awaited session. I am Mayor Tore, a third-year gas and petrochemical engineer student at Alexandria University, and I'll be your moderator for today. Before we start, please, I'd like to remind you to drop your questions in the Q&A section below. Please keep the chat box professional and ethical. And please don't forget to submit your quizzes before the deadline. Now, let us give a warm welcome to Dr. Ahmad El Bambi, who will give us a session in handling PVT properties. Dr. Ahmad is a professor of petroleum engineering and chair of the department at the American U University in Cairo. Previously, Dr. Ahmad worked for Cairo University, where he still teaches graduate and undergraduate courses. Dr. Ahmad has 20 years of diversified international experience in reservoir and petroleum engineering. Dr. Ahmad worked as an engineer, manager, trainer, and technology developer. Dr. Ahmad spent 12 years in Schlumberger, where he held a variety of technical and managerial positions in five countries. Dr. Ahmad authored and co-authored one book, two book chapters, more than 90 technical papers, and holds one U.S. patent. Dr. Ahmad has been on numerous SPE committees, program chair for the 2015 North Africa Technical Conference, and technical editor for several journals. Dr. Ahmad is the current program chairman of the SPE Egyptian section. Dr. Ahmad holds bachelor and, ma and master's degree from Cairo University and master's and PhD degree from Texas A&M University, all in petroleum engineering. Dr. Ahmad, thank you so much for coming and the mic is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mayar, and uh, uh, good evening and good afternoon and uh, good morning for everyone who's listening. Uh, uh, what I will be talking about for uh, the uh, next uh, one hour or so, or uh, probably less, uh, is handling PVT properties for, uh, for gases. Uh, the uh, petroleum engineers among you, uh, usually in the undergraduate, we, uh, we study about PVT properties for uh, dry gas. I would like to uh, shed uh, some light on uh, uh, how we handle PVT properties for uh, other gases, uh, namely wet gases and gas condensates, and what are the uh, most important differences that uh, we need to worry about as um, production or reservoir engineers when we are um, uh, generating or preparing PVT properties for uh, the, uh, the gases that we uh, deal with. All right, uh, the uh, references or uh, the majority of what I'm going to talk about comes from uh, this book, uh, PVT Property Correlations, uh, Selection and Estimation. And in particular, uh, chapter two, uh, we'll talk about the uh, classification of reservoir fluids. In chapter three in the book, we talked about dry gases or engineering dry gases, which is usually what we cover in uh, undergraduate courses. And then in chapter four and five, uh, we talked about uh, engineering wet gases and gas condensates. Uh, let me start by uh, looking at the uh, differences between uh, the behavior of uh, what we call dry gas and what we call wet gas and what we call uh, gas condensate. So this is a typical phase, uh, uh, phase diagram of a dry gas reservoir. Notice here, uh, by the way, these fluids that were um, talking about here are uh, uh, real fluids. Uh, we have PVT uh, reports for them, and then we model them so we can see, or we can draw the uh, phase envelope as you can see it here. So in this particular case, it's a, it is considered to be a dry gas reservoir. Notice that the reservoir temperature is here, around 180 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Surface temperature or surface separator conditions are uh, around this point. And as you can see, the two phase region for the, uh, phase, uh, the phase envelope are completely away from reservoir temperature and even uh, surface temperature. So whenever we have a fluid like this, 
uh, if we have a phase envelope or a phase uh, diagram for a fluid that looks like that, we classify this as dry gas. By the way, let me tell you something uh, for the nomenclature. Uh, what we, uh, if you're talking to reservoir engineers and you say natural gas, we're, we're definitely we are talking about the natural gas that we produce from our subsurface reservoirs. If you're talking to uh, operations people, if you're talking to uh, uh, anyone uh, who's not really uh, intimate with what we do in petroleum engineering, and you say natural gas, usually they think of methane, uh, C1. Because this is what we normally use in the uh, industry. This is what we burn. This is what we get heat from, uh, C1. Of course, C1 is used in other things as well like it is used as raw material for uh, fertilizers, uh, for the uh, cement industry. But usually what we do is we burn the C1, uh, the methane, and we extract the heat from it. And then we use the heat in power generation, in industrial use, uh, etc. So the, the terminology uh, natural gas uh, for surface people, it may mean uh, methane, uh, C1, but for petroleum engineers, usually it means the gas that we find in nature and we produce it from the subsurface reservoirs. The natural gas that we produce from subsurface reservoirs contains methane, ethane, propane, etc. Okay. This phase envelope that you're looking at is actually the phase envelope of methane uh, or a gas that, uh, that has 99.9% uh, methane. Uh, strictly speaking, this is probably the, uh, or if I have a little bit of uh, ethane and propane added to the methane, we will not get this kind of phase envelope. We will get uh, a two-phase region that's, uh, that's shifted to the right. So you can think of dry gas as something that does not really exist in real life. Uh, it's a model. So when we, uh, when we talk about dry gas in, in reservoir engineering context, we are talking about gases that produce on surface very little amount of condensate. Uh, but it is not really 100% of dry gas. Uh, the phase envelope that we're looking at is a phase envelope of 100% of dry gas because as you can see, the um, uh, reservoir uh, temperature is higher than what we call the cry con condensate, uh, and there is no way in the reservoir to form uh, condensate, and there is no way in uh, on surface to form uh, condensate as well. Contrast this with what we call wet gas. So in wet gas, what we see is the reservoir temperature is outside the two-phase region, but the surface temperature or the surface conditions are inside the two-phase region. What does that mean? This means that uh, the gas under reservoir conditions is single-phase gas. When it goes to surface, when we produce it, it produces some condensate. So on surface, I have gas and condensate. Okay? And this is a very important distinction, and it has lots of uh, economic considerations as well. The third type of gas is the uh, what we call uh, retrograde gas. Again, this is a, a, a real uh, fluid uh, at a very deep uh, reservoir. Reservoir temperature is close to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And what you can see uh, is that the reservoir temperature is less than the cry condensate. Uh, cry condensate is the maximum uh, temperature of the two phase region. So when the reservoir temperature uh, is less than the cry uh, what happens is that when we deplete the reservoir, the pressure goes down uh, in the reservoir until it reaches what we call the dew point. And by the way, when you're talking, when you're talking to uh, subsurface engineers and you say dew point, we mean dew point at reservoir temperature. When you're talking to uh, processing people and, uh, or uh, people who work on, on surface, you really need to specify for them what dew point you're talking about. Are you talking about dew point at 300 degrees Fahrenheit or dew point at the uh, separator temperature or surface temperature, etc. 
So in gas condensate, the uh, behavior of gas condensate is as follows. Once we reach the uh, dew point in the reservoir and we start depleting the reservoir some more, uh, some of the condensate that's evaporized in the gas will condense uh, and becomes liquid uh, under reservoir conditions. Usually the amount of condensate is, uh, is, is little. Um, the, probably the uh, theoretical maximum of that is around 40 or 45 percent. But for the majority of the gas condensate reservoirs that we deal with, the amount of condensate that drops out of the reservoir is a small amount. Condensate has low mobility compared to the gas. So you have uh, low condensate saturation, high gas saturation, and you have uh, low mobility for the condensate and high mobility for the gas. So guess what happens? This condensate is lost in the reservoir and we cannot recover it um, unless we go through uh, expensive uh, gas uh, recycling or gas cycling uh, operations. Uh, in today's environment, uh, we don't really see a lot of gas cycling operations because gas is used everywhere uh, in, in, a, in, in a lot of countries. So gas has a price. In the old days, uh, gas didn't really uh, have the same economic value uh, that it has today. And therefore, we had in the past uh, several gas cycling uh, projects in which we take the, um, the, we produce the gas condensate we drop the condensate on surface, and then we recycle the dry gas and re-inject it into the reservoir. So the, when we recycle the gas and, and inject it into the reservoir, it will go and contact the uh, gas condensate that's left in the uh, pore spaces, and it will re-vaporize some of this gas condensate and uh, takes the condensate to the surface, drop, we strip the condensate on surface, and then we re-inject the gas. So this is what happens in gas cycling, which, um, uh, which may not be very economic uh, these days. On surface, what happens in gas condensate reservoirs is that the, um, uh, the gas that we're producing, whether we are above the, the dew point or below the dew point, this gas uh, has some condensate still uh, has vaporized condensate in it that will drop out in the uh, on surface. Uh, this condensate is very valuable and towards the end of my presentation today we will look at some real numbers to see uh, the value of this condensate uh, versus uh, the gas itself. So now we understand the behavior of uh, dry gas, wet gas, and gas condensate from uh, the reservoir point of view and what we expect on surface. So in strictly dry gas, we expect to produce only gas. We normally say the gas composition in the reservoir is equal to the gas composition on surface. For wet gas, we normally say the gas uh, under reservoir conditions or if I take the gas on surface plus the condensate that we produce on surface, it will give me the composition of the gas under reservoir conditions. For gas condensates, above the bubble point, you can treat the gas condensate reservoir as if it were a wet gas reservoir. But below the bubble point, uh, below the dew point, uh, due to the dropout of condensate in the reservoir, what you're producing on surface does not represent the composition of the gas uh, under reservoir conditions. Let's distinguish uh, some terminology here between what we call undersaturated and saturated. Undersaturated gas reservoir and undersaturated oil reservoir. What temperature do you think we find our uh, reservoirs? Usually we find our reservoirs uh, in a temperature, let's say, somewhere between 80 degrees Fahrenheit to 350. By the way, at elevated temperatures, we, we will not be able to produce oil or, uh, or gas at very, very deep reservoirs. Uh, of course, when you go deeper into uh, the, uh, the, uh, the planet, when you drill uh, deeper, the temperature increases. Normally, normally, we will not find oil or gas at temperatures higher than 350 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Why is that? For two reasons. Um, to, uh, 
to get to that level of temperature, this high level of temperature under reservoir conditions, usually you have to drill very, very deep, uh, usually at this depth. Uh, there isn't really enough porosity to find commercial uh, gas or oil. And the other reason is the hydrocarbon will be cooked at very high temperature, so it will turn into something else. Uh, it will not be gas or oil uh, that can flow when we drill wells and, and flow them. So the temperature range that we usually uh, find uh, our oil and gas reservoirs or our oil and gas fluids is usually between 80 degrees, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, all the way to 350. So if you look at this phase envelope on the left-hand side and imagine that I found my reservoir uh, in these conditions, temperature uh, 180 degrees Fahrenheit, the initial reservoir pressure 5,000 PSI or so, so the, um, uh, if I find my reservoir conditions here, that will be uh, under saturated gas reservoir. Look at the other uh, phase envelope. Again, the temperature range that we usually find uh, our commercial fluids at is between 80 to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. At any temperature, I will have an oil uh, reservoir with a bubble point for this phase envelope on the uh, right hand side or the lower half of the slide. So we call this under saturated reservoir. So what is a saturated reservoir? A saturated reservoir, if the fluid is black oil, uh, this is an example, the one on top here is an example of a reservoir that has initially a gas cap and uh, oil reservoir. By the way, if the gas cap is the majority, if the gas cap is big and the oil reservoir is small, we call it gas reservoir, saturated gas reservoir. If the oil uh, is the majority and the gas cap is a small, we call it saturated oil reservoir. If the fluid is black oil, uh, usually we find the gas to be wet gas or uh, close to dry gas let's say slightly with gas or light with gas and this example here shows the um, the solid line is the phase envelope of the oil the if i take a sample from the oil zone here uh, it will give me phase envelope like uh, the uh, the one given by the solid line and if i take a sample from the gas zone it will give me uh, a phase envelope like the one we uh, with the uh, uh, dashed line here the two phase envelopes will intersect at the initial reservoir pressure and initial, oh, not the initial, uh, at the reservoir temperature and initial reservoir pressure. The uh, two phase envelopes, uh, okay, will intersect also at the dew point pressure for the gas, for the gas cap. If I take uh, a sample from the gas and send it to the lab, it will give me dew point pressure this value and if i take a sample from the oil zone and send it to the lab it will give me bubble point pressure at the same value so the initial reservoir theoretically speaking the initial reservoir pressure is equal to the dew point pressure for the gas is equal to the bubble point pressure for the oil the two examples that we're looking at at the bottom of the slide the one on the right hand side and the one on the left hand side i don't know which is which uh, they are actually for uh, volatile oil and gas condensate. So if we have a gas cap for an oil reservoir and the oil is volatile, the gas cap will be gas condensate. And if I have a gas condensate reservoir with uh, an oil leg, the oil leg will contain uh, volatile oil. And this is very clear from the phase envelope. So the, again, the, solid, em the uh, solid line represents the phase envelope for the oil and the dashed line represents the phase envelope for the gas condensate. The solid line here is phase envelope for volatile oil, and the uh, dashed line represents phase envelope for gas condensate. And this is why we say gas associated with black oil is uh, wet gas that can be uh, sometimes approximated to be dry gas, but gas associated with volatile oil is gas condensate. When do we have uh, saturated gas condensate reservoir and when do we have saturated volatile oil uh, reservoir actually it depends on the majority of the fluid we have 
if the gas cap is big and the oil leg is small, then it will be a gas condensate reservoir. If the oil zone is big and the gas cap is small, it will be a saturated uh, oil reservoir or saturated volatile oil reservoir. So now we understand the behavior of the three gases, dry gas, wet gas, and uh, gas condensate, and we understand also the difference between what we call undersaturated reservoir and saturated reservoir. So this is a real example of, uh, uh, of a phase envelope. Uh, you can see here all of these points are actually measured in what we call CCE experiment, constant composition experiment in the lab. Uh, so these points are measured using the constant composition experiment in the lab. Uh, then we can draw the phase envelope from the measurements uh, of the CCE experiment at different temperatures. So we have the PVT cell, we put the uh, fluid in the PVT cell, we subject it to uh, different uh, temperatures, and then we uh, perform uh, a constant composition expansion experiment, and then we can get these uh, values, and then we draw the phase envelope. This phase envelope is for what we call near critical fluid because I don't know, it, it actually depends. If the temperature is here, if the reservoir temperature is, uh, let's say, 240 to, or 230, I would have gas condensate. If the reservoir temperature is 150, I will have volatile oil fluid. This fluid must be gas condensate. Why? Again, temperature that the temperatures that we normally find our uh, reservoir fluids at is somewhere between 80 degrees Fahrenheit to 350. All right. Can you see my screen now? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Good. So uh, between 80 degrees to uh, 350 degrees, we have at any temperature, we would have gas condensate for this sample. Uh, what is this reservoir fluid likely to be? If you look at temperatures from 80 degrees onward, so this is the range of uh, reservoir temperatures. At any reservoir temperature, I think we'll have a dry gas if we have uh, a fluid like that. Uh, components of naturally occurring petroleum fluids uh, for any naturally occurring uh, gas, uh, usually have a lot of methane. Uh, usually the impurities that we may have, or the most common impurities, include hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and uh, nitrogen. All of them are bad, and usually if we're processing the gas to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, take it to uh, the specifications for uh, the sales gas, usually we have to get rid of the hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide, and uh, nitrogen. Uh, how do we know what kind of fluid we have? We have to look at the heptanes plus, and I can tell you right away that for this level of heptanes plus, this is a good uh, gas condenser. Um, when we classify, uh, or when we look at the differences between dry gas, wet gas, and uh, gas condensate, uh, how do we classify them? Uh, we look at things like uh, maximum liquid saturation that can drop out in the reservoir versus 27 plus more uh, percent. So this is the maximum liquid saturation that can drop out in the reservoir. For every uh, circle here, every circle represents uh, a different gas. So of course you can see when the C7 plus is very low, the amount the, or the maximum liquid saturation that can drop out in the reservoir is almost zero. And with the increase in C7 plus uh, mole percent, the composition of heptanes and the heavier, uh, you see that the maximum liquid saturation uh, can go up to 50% uh, in, in that range of uh, C7 plus. If we plot the pressure at the maximum liquid saturation, so at what pressure uh, does this maximum liquid saturation happen or drop out in the reservoir? Again, with the increase in C7 plus mole percent, we see increase in the pressure at which the maximum liquid saturation occurs. 
if the maximum liquid saturation occurs at very low pressure here, less than 1000 psi, usually we do not reach that level of pressure in our operation. So um, I don't care about it. Uh, what does that mean? Remember that you have to have a uh, certain level of pressure in your wells, so the pressure can uh, push the gas to surface. So usually we do not operate gas reservoirs at pressures below maybe uh, 600 or 700 psi, unless these gas reservoirs are very, very, very shallow reservoirs. Uh, but for uh, if the uh, liquid saturation, if the maximum liquid saturation occurs in a particular fluid at, let's say, 3000 uh, psi, no, I will operate the gas reservoir at pressures above 3000 and below 3000. So I need to deplete the gas reservoir below that. So the amount of condensate becomes significant in our calculations and it will affect the economic uh value of the gas reservoir if i look at the surface gas oil ratio that we produce at uh, notice that the y-axis here is logarithmic and the x-axis is cartesian on the x-axis we have c7 plus mole percent again for um very low c7 plus the gas the surface gas oil ratio is very high above probably hundred thousand uh, standard cubic foot per stock tank barrel, standard cubic foot per stock tank barrel, which is equivalent to condensate gas ratio, condensate gas ratio, less than 10 barrels per uh, million cubic foot of gas we produce. When the C7 plus is at a higher level, we see that we uh, the uh, producing gas ratio is somewhere between 3,000 to maybe 10,000 Standard cubic foot per stock tank barrel, and this is the where where we find the gas tendency uh, behavior. To summarize, um, this table we can use to classify the uh, reservoir fluids. Uh, of course, we're talking about gases today, so we can focus on the right hand side uh, of the table. Uh, the left hand side has the um, uh, classification for volatile oil, black oil, and low gas oil ratio oil. Uh, if we're focusing on gas um, from the initial producing gas oil ratio, if the initial producing gas oil ratio is greater than 100,000, then uh, the, um, uh, which means the condensate gas ratio is less than 10 barrels, 10 barrels per million cubic foot, then this I can deal with the gas as if it were dry gas. If, if the uh, gas oil ratio is greater than 33,000, we should deal with this gas as, uh, I'm sorry, if the gas oil ratio is less than 30, uh, 33,000, we should deal with this gas as wet gas. And if the gas is, is between, the gas oil ratio is between 3,233,000, we should treat this gas as gas condensate. If you look at more uh, accurate evidence here, if we have the gas composition, if the gas composition is reported, and the um, uh, C7 plus mole percent is less than 0.7%, which is less than 1%, we can deal with the gas as if it were dry gas. Uh, for C7 plus between 0.7% and 2%, we need to deal with the gas as uh, wet gas. And for anything higher than 2%, C7 plus uh, 2%, all the way to 12.75%, uh, we should deal with this gas as gas condensate. Dealing with dry gas is easy and simple from reservoir engineering calculations point of view, and also from preparation of PDP properties uh, point of view. Dealing with wet gas, we will talk about uh, what we can uh, what we can do with the wet gas and to deal with the gas as gas condensate uh, if you really want to be accurate we need to deal with it uh, uh, using uh, equations of the state and equation of the state models there are some approximations to equation of the state and I will talk about these approximations and the correlations uh, today
So uh, dry gas, which we normally cover in the uh, undergraduate, uh, as I said, we, uh, we look at uh, the uh, PVP properties and how we uh, generate uh, all PVP properties versus pressure. And we usually generate these PVP properties using uh, correlation. For wet gas, there are two approaches. Wet gases can be treated similar to uh, gas condensate reservoirs, which means I need to have a complete lab report. I need to have complete set of PVP experiments, including the um, constant volume depletion experiment. And uh, we model uh, the, um, uh, the lab uh, observations or lab measurements using an equation of the state model. And then I ask the equation of the state program to calculate the PVP properties for us. The other way is to deal with the wet gas as if it were dry gas with uh, a correction here. So what we do is we modify the gas specific gravity to represent both surface gas and condensate. Uh, remember in dry gas, the, the surface gas specific gravity is equal to the reservoir gas specific gravity. But in wet gas, this is not true. So I, uh, what I measure on the surface for the gas stream in wet gases is the surface gas specific gravity or the surface gas composition. Then I need to add to this uh, surface gas, I need to add the condensate and correct or modify the gas specific gravity so I can reach the gas specific gravity for the reservoir gas and then deal with the wet gas as if it were dry gas, which means I would use all the correlations that we use for dry gas, we use them for wet gas, but after we modify the gas specific gravity. So if, we're, uh, if we want to deal with the gas uh, as uh, gas condensate, for gas condensate, I need to do some, uh, I need to take a representative fluid sample and then send it to the lab and get uh, a PVP report and then model this PVP report with an equation of state. Just to review uh, what we do or to summarize what we do in lab experiments, if we're dealing with black oil, usually we have in the PVP report of these five uh, experiments, composition, constant composition expansion, CCE, differential liber liberation, separator test, and viscosity. If we're dealing with low gas oil ratio, usually we have composition, CCE, and viscosity only. Uh, in low gas oil ratio oil, the bubble point occurs at very, very low pressure, sometimes 100 psi, 200 psi, maybe maximum 300 psi. So we are not, uh, this level of pressure we will never reach in our operations, in real life operations, and therefore we don't really care about differential liberation because differential liberation uh, simulates the behavior of the fluid below the bubble point. So if I don't reach the bubble point in the reservoir, then I don't really need the differential liberation experiment. And this is one difference between black oils and low gas oil issue oils. In volatile oils, we do the same five experiments, but we do on top of that what we call constant volume depletion experiment, which was invented for gas condensate reservoir. For gas condensates, uh, we do composition, CCE, constant volume depletion experiment. Usually we don't do separator tests. I've seen separator tests done in probably less than 5% of uh, PVP reports for gas condensate. And viscosity for gas is always calculated from correlations. It is not measured in the lab. For dry gas, we only need composition. And uh, it is easy to do because all what we need to do is to go to the wellhead and take sample from the gas, and there are actually portable uh, gas chromatograph. I can even take it to the well, to the wellhead or to the well site, and inject the uh, a sample of the gas into the gas chromatograph and get the composition. So this is very easy. For wet gases, if I deal with them as if they were dry gases, so all I need is the composition. But there is a caveat here. I will talk about it in a minute. And if the wet gas is a bit closer to the uh, gas condensate, it is best that we deal with it as if it were gas condensate, which means take a representative a reservoir flow sample and send it to the lab and get a uh, full uh, PVP report, uh, including uh, all these experiments. 
uh, for the wet gas. For wet gas, uh, if I have only the composition, uh, usually it is best here to measure this composition in the lab because we need to uh, uh, measure the uh, molecular weight of the C7 plus and the specific gravity of the C7 plus. If you measure it at the well site, uh, we will not be able to measure the molecular weight and the specific gravity of the uh, C7 plus because we don't really separate uh, the flow. So calculation of wet gas specific gravity. So if I'm going to deal with the wet gas uh, as if it were dry gas, there are options to calculate the wet gas specific gravity. Number one, if I have the gas composition and I'm happy with the gas composi composition, the wet gas composition, then we can follow very similar procedure to what we do in dry gas, which means we uh, calculate uh, the uh, critical properties, critical pressure, critical temperature for the gas, then reduce the pressure and reduce temperature, then Z factor, then everything else from Z factor. If uh, I have the composition, I have an alternative way, which is calculate the specific gravity from the composition, and then use the specific gravity in the calculation of Z factor and the rest of the PVT property. If I don't have the composition of the gas, there is a crude way of getting the specific gravity of uh, wet gas, which is by the knowledge of the sur surface CGR, condensate gas ratio, and the API gravity of the stock tank oil or the stock tank condensate. So on surface, I have gas that's coming out from the separator. Usually this is the gas that we sell. And we also have some condensate in the, uh, in the stock tank. And usually we sell this condensate as well in the stock tank. Usually we blend it with oil to improve uh, oil properties uh, in the uh, nearby field. So the, the, uh, we, we take a sample from the uh, stock tank uh, oil and we measure API in the field. And this is the API that we can use in the correlations or the equations that I'm going to show you in, in a minute. There are uh, other approaches here. These two, if I know uh, for two-stage separation systems and three-stage separation systems, if I know the gas oil ratio for, the, um, for every separator and the stock tank, and I know uh, some additional properties, I can calculate the uh, wet gas specific gravity. Usually, we don't know that in the reservoir, and this is why we call them theoretical. We don't know that in our operation. The practical approaches, so there's a practical approach for uh, two-stage separation and three-stage separation. In these two practical approaches, all I need is R1, which is the gas ratio of the separator, and I need the API gravity of the uh, stock tank, and I need separated conditions. R1, which is the specific gravity of uh, the primary separator, is always known. Why? Because we usually sell the gas from that primary separator. Uh, we do not normally sell the gas from the stock tank, and this is why we don't really measure the gas that's coming out from the stock tank. API, we sell the condensate, so we know the API. And we operate the, uh, the separator, so we know the temperature and the pressure of every separator we have. So the, uh, these two correlations that we call practical here use data that's readily available in the field. The two ones that, uh, the two uh, techniques that we call theoretical here use data that's not normally available in the field. But in case you have them, you can use them. They should provide more accurate data. So how is, how is that done? Uh, these are the equations we use um, to uh, compute the specific gravity of the wet gas, W here for wet gas, uh, in case of three-phase separation. And the second equation is, uh, is what we use in case of uh, two-phase uh, separation. These equations are theoretical and actually they require knowledge of specific gravity of the oil, which is easy because specific gravity of the oil is related to API of the oil, but they also require the molecular weight of the condensate in the stock tank. This is not easy because we do not measure molecular weight in, uh, in the field. 
to measure molecular weight, you, you actually have to go to a sophisticated lab, uh, which and these equipment do not exist in, in the labs that we have in our operations in the field operation. So we can replace uh, the molecular weight of the oil here with a correlation. So there are co correlations that are dependent on the API. So if I know the API, I can calculate the molecular weight of the condensate. So there is no problem with the M anymore. We can go back to the same slide. Uh, what else uh, do we have here? R1 is the uh, gas ratio of the separator. This is normally known. Specific gravity of the gas gamma 1, specific gravity of the gas that's coming out from the primary separator. This is also known because this is the gas that we said. Uh, usually uh, R2 and R3, uh, if we, this is the secondary uh, separator gas ratio, and R3 is the spectrum gas ratio. Usually you don't know that. So they are replaced with what we call GPA and B equivalent. And there are correlations for GPA and B equivalent for two stage separation and three stage separation. So uh, this is what we call the practical approach. So in the practical approach, I need to know the gas ratio of the primary separator, specific gravity of the gas of the primary separator, specific gravity of the condensate, and uh, the rest. GPA and B equivalent, we will calculate from correlations. Uh, and these correlations are easy to use. Where do we find all of these correlations for all PVT properties? Uh, associated with the book, there is this website. Uh, actually, it's a free website. Uh, we developed a lot of these correlations, and uh, they are uh, there on the website. You can, you can go to this website and uh, register, you just need to put your name uh, and choose a password so uh, the database can identify you. And uh, you will see uh, uh, a place where you can input the pressure values, uh, table of pressures, and then uh, you can choose the fluid type, dry gas with gas, gas condensate, black oil, or volatile oil, and you have a set of correlations that you can use to uh, compute uh, the PVT properties uh, for any code that you want. And the computations will be drawn for you also. There are plots uh, in which you can uh, copy the plots and put them in PowerPoint or take the values from the table and uh, you can copy and paste them in Word or uh, PowerPoint or Excel. So it's an interesting uh, place. If you need to make any calculations, you can uh, uh, go ahead and use it and it's a free utility. So what PVT properties do we normally calculate for gases? We calculate Z factor. We need to use it in every calculation we have in production engineering or reservoir engineering. We need formation volume factor, gas density, gas viscosity, gas compressibility, and to sell the gas, we need the heating value. So for dry gases, I need up to here. For engineering wet gases and gas condensate, I also need dew point. For engineering gas condensates, I also need the, what we call two-phase z-factor and NGL. NGL is uh, NGL refers to natural gas liquids. So the uh, where do we uh, use the two-phase z-factor? It has one place where we use it. If you're doing material balance calculations for gas condensate reservoir, you should be using the two-phase Z factor in place of the single phase Z factor. I think uh, the uh, petroleum engineers remember this very famous plot, plot that we create for uh, dry gas, P over Z versus GP. For volumetric reservoirs, we should have a straight line. If I'm dealing with um, uh, a gas condensate reservoir, you should replace the P over Z with P over two-phase Two phase uh, Z factor, all right, versus GP equivalent, all right, which is uh, which takes into consideration the amount of condensate that we produce on surface. So, this is about the only place where we really need to use uh, the two phase uh, uh, Z factor. The rest of the PVT properties, the above, the ones above here, are used in every calculation we have, whether you're doing calculations for production engineering or 
for reservoir engineering. When you're dealing with economic calculations, heating value becomes important. NGL becomes important as well as I will show in, uh, in, an, in an example in few minutes. Uh, there is also an approach, so I said in the beginning that uh, to deal or to handle uh, gas condensate uh, reservoirs, we need to develop uh, an equation of the state program, uh, I'm sorry, equation of the state model, and we use the equation of the state model in our calculations. So uh, sometimes this is, this is an overkill. Uh, so there, there is another approach to handle gas condensates, and we, uh, we call it modified black oil approach. The difference uh, between uh, modified black oil approach and black oil approach is the way we handle uh, the vaporized condensate in the gas phase. So what's really the difference between gas condensates and dry gas from a physical point of view? Dry gas, the assumption here, it does not contain any condensate. The gas condensate, the assumption here is that the, the gas itself has some vaporized condensate that's uh, vaporized under uh, high pressure and high temperature, under reservoir temperature and pressure. When I take this gas to the surface, uh, the gas cannot handle the condensate, cannot contain all this condensate, vaporized condensate in it, and the condensate will drop out. This is actually very similar to uh, the viewpoint. If, you're, if you uh, listen to the weather channel, uh, you see the um, uh, the person saying, okay, uh, the uh, weather is cold, uh, we have a viewpoint of blah, blah, blah. Uh, so they're talking here about the ability of air to vaporize the uh, water vapor. So in the um, uh, early in the morning when the temperature is low, we see droplets of water uh, on your window in the morning. When the sun comes up, uh, and let's say around noon time, uh, the uh, temperature of air becomes higher, and the air can revaporize this uh, condensed water, this condensed water, and then the uh, the uh, the air will will be saturated with water uh, vapor. So we understand this phenomenon because we see it. Uh, what happens in our reservoir is very similar. The gas can contain vaporized condensate under certain pressure and temperature, high pressure and high temperature. When I take this gas to the surface, uh, the gas cannot uh, contain this vaporized condensate and it has to drop out some of this condensate. By the way, this is great for us because the condens condensate has a lot of uh, value. So to use this modified black oil approach, I need four PVT properties instead of three in the black oil approach. So I need the gas formation volume factor, which looks like that. I need the oil formation volume factor, which looks like that. And I need the gas oil ratio, the RS, gas oil ratio. Everybody knows the RS. And the additional function that I need to use is called RV. And this is called vaporized. V here for vaporized. Vaporized oil gas station, which means how at uh, at a particular temperature and pressure, how much condensate is vaporized in the gas. So when I take it to standard pressure and temperature, it will drop in. Okay. So this is what RV means. So this is another approach, and it is pretty accurate as long as the composition of the, uh, of, of the gas can be considered uh, more or less constant during uh, operating our gas. Uh, this is the modified black oil uh, approach. What's important for companies here is the economics or economic impact for gas reservoirs. When we find, uh, for oil and gas companies, when they find uh, subsurface uh, natural gas reservoir, uh, how do we sell the gas or how do we monetize the gas? Uh, there are three options. Gas can be sold at the wellhead. What does that mean? the oil company will sell the gas at the wellhead. So uh, there is an intermediate company, transportation company, that builds pipelines, connects their pipelines to your wellheads or to the oil company wellheads, and then takes the gas at the wellhead and then 
uh, push it, compress it into the network uh, of pipelines, and then sell it to the end consumer. Then the consumer could be uh, us, uh, our houses, if uh, natural gas is, is uh, sent to our houses. It could be a uh, steel uh, uh, manufacturing plant or a steel manufacturing uh, company. It could be a power company. It's a, any consumer of the gas. So the oil company makes the money at the wellhead. So when we when gas is sold at the wellhead, usually it is sold based on the calorific value of the gas. The other option is the oil company will build simple facilities to process the gas. And the simple facilities will be separator and stock tank. So in the separator and the stock tank, we will uh, separate the majority of the condensate so we can sell the condensate on its own. So by tracking it, for example, or by building a pipeline uh, with a pump to pump the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, condensate, and we sell the gas from the uh, separator. If we separate the gas at high pressure, uh, we will save money on transporting the gas. Why? Because if we separate the gas at high pressure, I can send the gas uh, in a pipeline without compression. But the uh, uh, the bad thing about that is, is that I will not maximize the recovery of the condensate. If we separate the, uh, the gas on several steps, I will maximize the recovery of the condensate. So we'll make money uh, by selling the condensate. But to sell the gas, I have to compress it. So I spend money to sell the gas. So we have to work on the economics of uh, uh, the second option here. First option is easy. Okay? The second option, I, I will spend some money in processing, but I will make a lot more money by selling the condensate. Option number three is, uh, is more sophisticated. So I have to build a gas plant. We take the gas and we sell. We, we separate the gas into C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5 plus. Uh, from C2, from C2 to C5 plus, we call this natural gas liquid. And there are several levels of uh, gas plants. Uh, the sophisticated ones will separate each fraction on its own. So C2, uh, C3 on its own, C4 on, it, on its own, and C5 plus on its own. So if I have a sophisticated gas plant, we'll separate uh, the all the fractions of the gas. If we have a simpler gas plant, we may not be able to separate all the fractions of the gas. So the e economics here uh, play a big role in deciding uh, the level of sophistication in the gas plant and whether we're going to build a gas plant or we are not going to build uh, a gas plant. But if I reach that level, processing the gas to separate C1 from C2, from C3, from C4, from C5 plus, then I will be able to sell each uh, component uh, on its own and the company will make uh, actually good money. This is the best value for the gas. So these are the three options that we use to monetize our gas uh, reservoir. So let me talk a little bit about how we, uh, or the economic impact of uh, each option. To see the economic impact of each option, uh, let's illustrate this with an example. So we're looking at two gas samples here. One that has 3.5% C7 plus, sample one, and sample two uh, has 1.336% uh, C7 plus. Sample two is classified as wet gas, according to the table that I uh, presented, and sample one can be classified as gas condensate, but it's actually lean gas condensate, not really very rich gas condensate. So 3.5% C7 plus is a low quantity of condensate. Uh, if you have 8%, that would be great. If you have 12%, that would be fantastic. Okay. So let's take these two examples and work out some calculations. The uh, details of the calculations are actually in the book, but I will show you the results of the calculations so we can uh, drive the point that we're trying to make here. For heating value, if I calculate the heating value for um, sample one, it will be 
1339 BTU per SCF. For sample two, it will be around 1100 BTU British thermal unit for uh, every SCF that we produce. So what's the difference in value here? By the way, we sell the gas in option number one. Let me go back to the option. This is option number one, option number two, and option number three. So for option number one, if we sell the gas at the wellhead, the difference in price that we will realize for sample one and sample two will be, uh, I will get 20%, probably around 20% higher price for the same amount of gas that we uh, sell. Uh, I will get 20% higher price for sample one over sample two. Okay. So the difference is not huge. Let's look at approach two. If we sell the gas separate from the condensate, what engineering calculations can we make here? Uh, there is a procedure to uh, calculate BGI, which is the gas formation volume factor initially. Remember here, um, depending on the amount of condensate that you use to modify the specific gravity of the gas to represent so, so as to, uh, uh, so that the specific gravity of the gas represents the reservoir gas. The uh, reservoir gas that contains higher amount of C7 plus should have specific gravity that's higher than the other gas. When we use this specific gravity to calculate a quantity like BGI, uh, gas formation volume factor at initial reservoir pressure, uh, we will have difference actually in how much condensate we will recover for reservoir one and how much condensate we will recover for reservoir two. There are different techniques here we can use. Details of that are in this chapter in the book. I don't want to go into details of that. But in general, the uh, for a specific volume of reservoir one and reservoir two, the volume of reservoir one uh, is equal to volume of reservoir two. In the same volume, for reservoir one, I have in place oil or condensate in place 9.7 million barrels. In reservoir two, we have 2.1 uh, million barrels of condensate. Of course, this condensate does not exist in the reservoir as condensate. It is actually vaporized in the gas under reservoir conditions. But when we produce the gas to surface, we will uh, or this condensate will drop out and we will be able to collect this condensate in the stock tank and then sell it. So now, if we assume recovery factor, same recovery factor for reservoir one and reservoir two, let's say 85% recovery factor, and this is not unheard of. This is pretty normal for uh, this level of uh, wet gases. We can actually, if it's a volumetric reservoir, we can reach up to 90% uh, recovery. Uh, from uh, wet gas uh, uh, volumetric reservoir. If it's a gas condensate reservoir, 90% is too high, maybe 85% uh, is too high, but we can probably reach 70-75% uh, uh, recovery factor for the gas and maybe 60 or 65% uh, recovery factor for the condensate. But anyway, if we assume 85% recovery factor for both gas and condensate, Look at the money here. The value of the gas produced, assuming we sell the gas for $3 for, uh, per every uh, MSCF, 1,000 standard cubic foot, and we sell condensate for $50 per stock tank barrel. In today's environment, we will sell the condensate for higher and the gas for probably less, slightly less. This is how much money we're making from the, uh, the gas. And this is how much money we're making from the condensate. So the gas will make us in reservoir one, 363 million dollars, and the condensate will make us 405 million dollars. But for reservoir two, the gas will make us 360 million dollars, and the condensate will make us 93 million dollars. So the difference in is huge. There are two 
points to notice here. Number one, whenever we have an even a little bit of condensate uh, in, and we classify our reservoir fluid to be wet gas, I really need to worry about the condensate. Uh, unfortunately, we find many people uh, ignoring the fact that wet gas reservoirs produce an amount of condensate and they ignore uh, the amount of condensate that, we, that will be produced they ignore that in the calculation of the economic value of the project. So this is why we say failure to quantify the economic impact of the expected condensate production may lead to overlooking some potentially promising gas, uh, wet gas development projects. So uh, please uh, take that into consideration when you're dealing with wet gas or gas condensate reservoirs. So you have to uh, look into ways to monetize the condensate. The other observation that we see here Although the difference in C7 plus between uh, reservoir fluid number two and reservoir fluid number one, the difference is not that much. If you remember, reservoir fluid number one contains a 3.5% C7 plus, uh, reservoir two contains 1.5% C7 plus. So with this little difference in the C7 plus, look at the huge difference in value. The condensated reservoir one represents 52.7% of the project value, which means it will the economic gain from the condensate is even higher than the economic gain of the uh, the gas. Uh, and in the in reservoir number two, the condensate value represents 20% of the project value, and 80% of the project value uh, uh, is actually coming from the uh, gas seal. Okay. So for wet gas, please take a note of that. Uh, if we're dealing with uh, wet gas or gas condensates, another thing that brings the, uh, the money here, if we're looking into uh, approach number three to monetize the gas, approach number three is to process the gas and sell the components. So to monetize the gas or um, uh, to find out how much uh, I can recover from uh, the uh, the gas stream. We need to make what we call uh, GPM calculations or gallons per, per per thousand. Capital M in our oil industry uh, means one thousand. It's not one million. Okay, so GPM stands for gallon per thousand, which means how uh, how many gallons of C2, how many gallons of C3, how many gallons of C4, and how many gallons of C5 plus, I will recover for every thousand standard cubic foot, for every, for every MCF, uh, MSCF. If you don't like gallons, if you don't like to work, uh, to work with gallons, you can actually calculate it in gallons or you multiply times 23.81, and it will get, give you the GPM, uh, in barrels, barrels per million standard cubic foot. Usually we, we measure our uh, gas production in million standard cubic foot. So I would like to know how much C2, C3, C4, and C5 I will recover for every million standard cubic foot. Depending on the uh, level of sophistication of the uh, gas plant that you're using, so if you're using uh, absorption or lean oil plants, these are the cheapest plants, the old plants, or if you're using uh, refrigeration plants, or if you're using cryogenic uh, plants, the uh, fractions that you can recover from uh, ethane C2, propane C3, and butane C4, and contain uh, uh, plus C5 plus, uh, the, the, these represent the fractions of uh, the um, uh, amount of uh, NGL that you will uh, produce uh, for every type of plant. So this is this slide can allow you to make uh, the calculations, economic calculations, if you're planning to build uh, uh, a gas pipeline, uh, I'm sorry, a gas plant, to process the gas and then sell C1 separate from C2, C3, C4, and C5. Depending on uh, which approach will give the maximum value uh, to the project, usually we go and uh, use either approach number one, which is sale 
of the gas at the wellhead using the heating value, or approach number two, we separate the condensate from the gas and we set the condensate separate from the uh, from the gas, or approach number three, in which we can actually um, uh, uh, fractionate the gas and sell each component uh, on its own. So these calculations are very important for uh, engineering our gas reservoirs. So uh, what's the summary? Let me uh, review very quickly what we uh, did together in, the, in this uh, almost one hour. Uh, we spoke about the classification of gas reservoirs. Uh, so the uh, gas reservoirs uh, can be classified into dry gas, uh, wet gas, and gas condensates. Uh, the best way to classify uh, uh, your gas reservoirs will be to look at the C7+. plus. So if it is higher than 2%, the fluid is gas condensate, or you should be treating it uh, as gas condensate. If it is between 0.7% to 2%, we treat the gas as wet gas. And uh, if the amount of C7 plus in my reservoir gas is less than 0.7%, which is less than 1%, then we can deal with our gas as if it were dry gas. The PVT properties, the second point that we discussed is the PVT properties for gas reservoirs. We, uh, we generate these PVT properties using two approaches, correlations approach or lab experiments. If we use the lab experiments, for dry gas, I don't really need to do anything uh, other than the composition. For gas condensate, I need a complete PVT report, uh, which will contain composition, the results of the composition experiment, CCE experiment, constant volume depletion. Usually, we don't, we don't have uh, uh, separator experiments for gas condensate samples, and the viscosity is not measured for gases. It is actually calculated from correlation but you will have uh, these five uh, uh, experimental results in, in a typical PVT uh, report for gas condensate. With gases, I can choose my way of dealing with the wet gas. I can uh, use the dry gas approach or similar to dry gas, but I need here to correct the gas specific gravity to represent the, the reservoir gas specific gravity or we use the uh, gas condensate approach in which we will have a full PVT report. If we use correlations, then something like uh, the website that I show it to you, you can actually use it and it will give you the calculation for uh, dry gases, wet gases, and gas condensates. And it will give you all the PVT properties for the gas that we need to worry about that enter our production engineering and reservoir engineering calculation. These PVT properties include the following, Z factor, gas formation volume factor, gas density, gas viscosity, gas compressibility. For uh, economic calculations, uh, I need heating value. I need the natural gas liquid calculations. And we also uh, need the uh, dew point in general. Uh, to operate our gas reservoir. All of these properties can be either obtained from the lab experiments or from correlations. In the last part of the, um, of the presentation, we spoke about the economic considerations. We understand there are three ways to sell the gas in general, whether we're producing dry gas, wet gas, or gas condensate. So number one, to sell the gas at the wellhead in which we price the gas based on the heating value. Number two, to set the gas uh, separate from the condensate. Number three, to install a gas plant and then sell the fractions of the gas. Thank you. Thank um, you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for this super informative webinar. I'm sure we all benefit greatly from it. Now uh, we'll make a quick Q&A uh, session. And uh, our first question, um, why the oil and gas industry temperature cannot be above 350 Fahrenheit? Okay, um, for, uh, all right. Uh, you really need to drill to maybe a uh, depth uh, seven, eight kilometers to reach that level of, uh, of temperature at this uh, 
below uh, below uh, the mean sea level. So at this level, uh, usually the porosity uh, is very very small. So which means you do not find uh, a lot of reservoir rock at uh, at this level. And at very high temperature, also the hydrocarbon will be cooked and it will transform itself to something else, so we will not find uh, uh, reservoir fluids at higher temperature. Of course, you can find one or two exceptions, uh, maybe at 360 degrees Fahrenheit, but I'm not aware of uh, any reservoir fluid that exists at higher temperatures than, than that. And there is actually a correlation, since you spoke about the, um, uh, the uh, temperature, uh, at shallow temperature, uh, at shallow depth, uh, this is the uh, level of depth uh, where we where we uh, used to drill, uh, because the um, uh, in the beginning of the petroleum industry and until maybe late 60s, until the late 1960s, our drilling technology was not uh, great technology. So we used to drill wells down to maybe uh, one or two kilometers uh, uh, below below the uh, below the ground. So at this depth, we found uh, black oil, low gas oil ratio oil, and dry gas. To find the more interesting fluids like uh, volatile oils and gas condensates, you really need to drill deeper. And they occur uh, because the reservoir temperature at deeper horizons is higher. And this is why the reservoir temperature becomes closer to the critical, uh, critical temperature. And this is why we see volatile oil and uh, gas condensate in deeper reservoirs. So shallow reservoirs, you normally find low gas oil ratio oil, heavy oil, black oil, and sometimes dry gas. Uh, volatile oil and gas condensate, we find them in deeper reservoirs at higher temperature. Okay. Uh, and another one, is there, uh, there is, is there is a method that allow us to recuperate the maximum amount of condensate components? Okay. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you're talking about uh, the... When the gas reaches the wellhead, then we process the gas. We can do everything possible to recover the maximum amount of gas when the, ga the maximum amount of condensate from the gas when the gas is on surface. On surface, things are easy to deal with. with. But if you're asking about uh, what can we do to recover the maximum amount of condensate or prevent the uh, the condensate dropout in the reservoir because the condensate that drops out in the reservoir is lost for us. Uh, the, there are, okay. There is only probably one technique, which is uh, what we call gas cycling. Uh, so we, we produce the, um, the uh, gas condensate, uh, we produce the gas, strip out the condensate on surface and then re-inject the dry gas. When we re-inject the dry gas, there are two mechanisms here. Mechanism number one, the dry gas will, um, uh, will increase the reservoir pressure. So it will reduce the amount of condensate uh, that's, uh, that's going to drop out. And the other mechanism is that this dry gas will go, will travel into the porous spaces, it will contact the uh, condensate that's already dropped out. And because the dry gas doesn't contain a lot of condensate, so it will re-vaporize some of this condensate and it becomes wet gas or gas condensate. When we take it to the surface, it will drop the condensate. So the efficient mechanism from a, a technical point of view to recover the maximum amount of condensate uh, from the reservoir is actually gas cycling. But it's a question of economics. Yes, it is efficient, but if I'm going to uh, re remember when you re-inject the gas, you do not sell the gas. So it's you're, you're delaying your gas sales 20 years or 30 years. So if you calculate the net present value of that, it may not be economic. Uh, what we're seeing is the, uh, is the following. In the, in the past, gas was sold for very, very little amount of money. Uh, in today's environment, of course, gas is environmentally friendly, so it has a value. On top of that, one of the reasons why gas is sold at a lower price than the oil, although, uh, I mean, for the same uh, heat equivalency, 
gas is sold at a much lower price than the oil. Why is that? Because it is difficult to transport the gas. But more and more countries now have infrastructure to transport the gas, which means if I find gas somewhere nearby the infrastructure, it makes more economic sense to produce the gas, connect it to the infrastructure, and sell the gas. In the old days, we did not have enough infrastructure to transport the gas. So if you discover gas somewhere in, in the middle of nowhere, uh, uh, 300, 400 kilometers uh, away from any civilization, then probably what made economic sense back then was to recycle the gas, produce the condensate, and either build a pipeline for the condensate, for the liquid, or transport the liquid using trucking. Okay? And this is why in the old days, we, we used to see more gas cycling projects, but in, in, in today's environment, usually we do not see a lot of gas cycling uh, projects. I hope this is clear to everyone. Uh, yes, thank you. And our last question, how to distinguish between a highly volatile oil with a near critical point retrograde gas in lab? In, lab? in the lab? Yeah. Okay. Uh, sometimes it is difficult to distinguish uh, the uh, or to to know whether the um, uh, volatile oil or the gas condensate, uh, whether the fluid I'm looking at is, is volatile oil or gas condensate, because both of them will be um, uh, water-like. Uh, so they are colorless. Uh, they don't have a specific color. They are transparent. So when, when you are actually on the critical point, it is very difficult to distinguish the two, especially if there is H2S. Uh, if there isn't really H2S, usually we, we will be able to see the fluid as liquid. And then uh, when we reduce the pressure, we find bubbles of gas. Then the fluid is liquid. But on the other hand, if it's gas, uh, we will find droplets of liquid in it. So the uh, technician in the lab or the engineer in the lab will be able to distinguish whether this is, I'm starting from liquid or I'm starting from gas. And this is how we distinguish between uh, the gas condensate near critical and the volatile oil near critical. However, in some cases, especially if there is H2S, if there is a little bit of H2S uh, in the volatile oil or the gas condensate, sometimes it is really difficult in the lab to distinguish whether we have gas condensate or uh, volatile oil. Uh, in a situation like this, the, um, uh, the recommendation here is to do the six experiments. So to do uh, composition, uh, CCE, constant composition expansion, you do both uh, CVD, constant volume depletion, and, <clears throat> and differential liberation. And you do the viscosity measurement and separator uh, experiments. So you, you create uh, a lot of observations. And in a situation like this as well, it is best to develop an equation of the state using all of these created observations uh, in the lab. And then you can play scenarios with the equation of the state to see how we can maximize liquid recovery from that fluid, whether it is classified as gas condensate or volatile oil. So economically here, it will not make a difference whether I'm treating the fluid as gas condensate or uh, volatile oil. And uh, to get the maximum gain from a near critical fluids, hopefully, and usually, they are actually found uh, at high pressure and high temperature. Uh, deeper reservoirs. So usually in the beginning, at least the surface pressure is high and we can uh, use uh, three or four or sometimes five stage separation system to maximize the liquid recovery from these volatile fluids. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Ahmed, again, for your enormous effort in this terrific webinar. And now to highlight this session has been recorded and will be uploaded soon, soon on Biopatry YouTube channel. So kindly make sure to subscribe on our channel. Wishing you a great day. Stay safe and bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.